two years ago, the United States Supreme Court was looking at a rather controversial provision of the Affordable Care Act, a provision known as the individual mandate, a requirement that every person in the country have health insurance. Now, ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the mandate, held that it was constitutional. But just suppose that after the 2016 elections, a new president comes into office and says, you know what? I disagree. I think the individual mandate is unconstitutional. I disagree with the Congress that enacted the Affordable Care Act, with the president that signed it into law, and with the Supreme Court that upheld it. Yeah, the Supreme Court has an important role in interpreting the Constitution, but so do I. In fact, when I came into office, I took an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And in my view, that Constitution does not allow the government to require people to buy health insurance. So I will not enforce the individual mandate. Can a president really do that? Can the executive say, I think the law is unconstitutional and I just won't enforce it? Well, surely the answer must be no. We all learn, or most of us learn in high school civics. The legislature enacts the law, the judiciary interprets the law, and the executive enforces the law. That's what it means to be the executive branch. Well, it turns out the issue is not actually that simple. There's a strong argument that at least in some very rare cases, the executive should refuse to enforce a law that it views as unconstitutional. The trick is figuring out when those rare cases arise. When is it okay for the executive not to enforce the law? So I just want to give you a few examples. Example number one, a group of sheriffs in Colorado strongly object to Colorado's new gun control laws. These laws require additional background checks, regulate the amount of ammunition that can be in guns. And the Colorado sheriffs say, we think these laws violate the Second Amendment of the US Constitution, which guarantees a right to keep and bear arms. So we will not enforce these laws. In fact, the Colorado sheriffs have taken, this, taken it a step further. They have filed suit against the governor of Colorado, asking a court to declare these laws unconstitutional. Example number two. Many of you, I suspect, have heard of the US Supreme Court's decision in Miranda versus Arizona. In 1966, Chief Justice Earl Warren said to the world, before the police may question any suspect, they must say to that suspect, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Many of us know these words by heart because we watch Law and Order 24 hours of the day. <laughs> what many of us do not know is that in 1968, Congress enacted a law to overrule Miranda versus Arizona. That federal statute said, in effect, before the police question a suspect, the police do not have to tell that suspect that he has a right to remain silent. Why have we not heard of this law? Because the executive branch never enforced it. Democratic and Republican administrations alike said this law is unconstitutional and we will not enforce it. They said, much like the Colorado sheriffs, this law violates individual constitutional rights. In this case, the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. So these are situations where the executive refuses to enforce a law because it thinks it's unconstitutional. It's a very different matter when the executive refuses to enforce a law on what lawyers like to call policy grounds. Basically, the executive does not like the law. And that leads me to example number three. The Federal Controlled Substances Act absolutely prohibits the use, sale, and possession of marijuana. 
I'm sure the undergraduates in the room are very sad about this fact, but it is true. It prohibits it. Now, as many of you probably also know, a number of states have enacted laws to allow the use of marijuana for either recreational or medicinal purposes. Well, I want to be clear. There is no doubt that every marijuana dispensary in those states violates federal law. And yet, Attorney General Eric Holder has said that the U.S. Department of Justice will not, for the most part, enforce the Controlled Substances Act in states that allow the use of marijuana. In fact, Attorney General Eric Holder has gone a step further and said to banks, hey, you guys can take money from these dispensaries, even though that itself also violates federal law. Now, there could be a constitutional justification for this, not so much about individual rights, but about states' rights, the idea that a state should be able to decide what is criminal or not criminal within its borders. But that's not what the executive has argued. This case seems to be an executive disagreement with a policy underlying the Controlled Substances Act. And it's just a lot harder to justify an executive refusal to enforce the law on that ground. But why is the Constitution different? How is it somehow better when the executive refuses to enforce the law for constitutional reasons as opposed to some other reason? After all, the end result is the same. The law goes unenforced. The answer lies in the text and history of our constitutional system. Our Constitution tells the federal executive branch to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. It imposes that duty on the president, so the president can't just decide, I'm not going to enforce the law because I don't like it. But the rules are very different when that law is found to be unconstitutional. Because the Constitution also directs every executive official, federal, state, and local, to swear an oath to uphold the U.S. Constitution, above any and all other laws. In fact, the president takes a special oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. It was this oath that the Colorado sheriffs relied on when they said, we can't enforce these gun control laws. We take an oath to enforce Colorado law, but we also take an oath to support the U.S. Constitution, and we can't do both of those things in this case. Now, I think what many of us find troubling about what the Colorado sheriffs are doing is that they are relying on their own view of what the U.S. Constitution means. They're saying, we think the Second Amendment prohibits these laws, and for that reason, we will not enforce them. Does the executive have that independent power to interpret the Constitution? A lot of history says yes. In fact, the very first president who declared a power to independently interpret the Constitution, no matter what anyone else says, is also a very famous alum of this institution, Mr. Jefferson. The Sedition Act of 1798 made it a crime to criticize the federal government. Thomas Jefferson argued that this law violates the free speech clause of the First Amendment. And most of us today would agree, a fundamental part of free speech is the ability to criticize the government. Well, that may be clear to us today, it was not clear to Mr. Jefferson's contemporaries. In fact, many of the federal courts that considered the T Sedition Act held that it was constitutional, that it did not violate the First Amendment. So Mr. Jefferson took the issue to the political arena. The Sedition Act was a big part of the election of 1800 between Thomas Jefferson and then President John Adams. Ultimately, Mr. Jefferson prevailed, Congress came in, and voted to repeal the Sedition Act going forward. But the question still remained, what about all those people that violated the law while it was in effect? Thomas Jefferson said, I will not enforce the law. I know what the courts have said, but I disagree with the Congress that enacted it, with the prior president who signed it into law, and with all the courts that have upheld it. 
I think this law is patently unconstitutional, and to fill my oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, I have a duty not to enforce this law. Another one of our favorite presidents was also a big believer in a presidential power to interpret the Constitution, Abraham Lincoln. In 1857, the Supreme Court issued what is probably its most infamous decision of all time, Dred Scott versus Stanford. In Dred Scott, the US Supreme Court held that slaves were property, not people, and that Congress could not interfere with those property rights. Abraham Lincoln strongly disagreed with this decision. He criticized it when he ran for Senate in 1858, when he ran for president in 1860, and once he became president. And he acted on his independent view of the Constitution. Many people don't realize this, but when President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, that proclamation was directly at odds with governing Supreme Court precedent. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which outlawed slavery throughout the country, did not happen until 1865. So in 1863, when Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, it was arguably illegal at least if the law is what the Supreme Court says it is. But President Lincoln issued it anyway because he believed he had an independent duty to act on his own view of the US Constitution. Well, many of you are probably thinking, well, I'm happy to let Mr. Jefferson interpret the Constitution or Mr. Lincoln interpret the Constitution because they're probably gonna get it right. Does that mean we're really going to let every single executive official out there, however educated, however high up the food chain, to interpret the Constitution for himself or herself? That is one of the difficult questions about this issue. And that leads me to my fourth example from modern times, same-sex marriage. Attorney General Mark Herring, the Attorney General of Virginia, has declared that in his view, Virginia's ban on same-sex marriage violates the federal constitution. Attorney General Mark Herring says, this law violates the federal constitution both because it infringes on the fundamental right to marry and on equal protection principles because it discriminates against people on the basis of sexual orientation. So the Virginia Attorney General has said, I will not defend this law in court when it's challenged. But the Virginia executive is still enforcing the ban on same-sex marriage, still denying marriage licenses to same-sex couples who request them. And so basically, this seems like it's giving us the best of all possible worlds. The executive declares its view of what the Constitution means but lets the issue go to the judiciary so that the courts can decide if the executive was right or wrong. So there's a lot to be said for this approach, but there's also a lot to be said against it. Because if one believes, as Mr. Jefferson suggested, that the executive has a duty not to enforce a law that the executive believes is patently unconstitutional, then the executive has a duty not to enforce the ban on same-sex marriage, but to issue licenses to those who request it. Mr. Jefferson argued that when a law is fundamentally unconstitutional, the executive should do everything in the executive's power to make sure that that law does not injure another person. So, what's the answer? Well, many people think that law provides clear answers. One of the things that tends to surprise first-year law students more than anything else is that that's rarely the case. And I think in this context, the law really doesn't give us clear answers. Many of us want 
the Jeffersons of the world and the Lincolns of the world to be able to go out and protect our constitutional rights, but may not feel comfortable giving every state sheriff in the country that same power. Well, for those of you who think that the executive should have some, maybe not unlimited, but some power to independently interpret the Constitution and to act on that interpretation, I want to leave you with this reassuring thought. The executive never goes unchecked. The legislature is always there to oversee the executive, and so is the electorate. Ultimately, it is we the people who get to decide if the executive made the right call, either in enforcing or refusing to enforce the law. Ultimately, it is we the people who decide if the executive abided by its oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Thank you.